this day um, reminds us um, of the importance of standing together in solidarity um, to advance gender equality and women's rights. Because there are so many women around the world who still miss this and still are affected. Um, and um, the International Women's Day is a day to celebrate the resilience, strength, and achievements of women, um, as well as uh, to recognize the work that still needs to be done to achieve the gender equality. And uh, for, for us working on chemicals and waste, um, recognizing the need to address these issues in relation to women's health is one of the priority topics we all work on. And um, unfortunately, um, as we are celebrate the International Women's Day, we also uh, should remember women who passed away or who couldn't survive because of the exposure to toxic chemicals. And so we also uh, definitely remember uh, the many women who have uh, paved the way for us uh, and, and that uh, many more women continue to inspire us with their courage, with their determination and with their work to address this uh, huge uh, threat of exposure to toxic chemicals and uh, on women. We give an overview a little bit and talk about uh, the, where we are, um, some snapshots of where we are right now in studying the question I talked about, how do environmental chemicals influence breast cancer risk and what are some opportunities for uh, preventing exposure? And I really uh, appreciate being invited to join you today. So breast cancer is influenced at many stages of life. The risk of breast cancer can be influenced by factors like hormonal factors before birth um, and um, also exposures to DNA damaging agents during any of these times, but uh, during puberty, during pregnancy, and during menopause. Um, and so it's a long, it's a long period of time and um, that's, that means exposures are important at all periods, and uh, also that there are many opportunities for prevention uh, within these within these windows. Um, just to provide a little bit of um, of context, what, this is some world international data. So um, estimates from 2020 is that breast cancer is the uh, uh, the highest incidence and mortality for uh, for women, and um, uh, you know across the world, and um, in particular, we've been interested and worried about about the rates in younger women and women under 50. Breast cancer is six times more prevalent than any cancer among men for uh, for people under 50. So. Um, it's a really important cause of sickness and and uh, mortality uh, among women who are who, who are young, uh, relatively who are still parents, who are who are uh, raising their children, work contributing to their communities and workplaces, um, and and uh, it's a very uh, stark, uh, you know, uh, difference in in um, or increase or not increase, but like the the magnitude, the extent and prevalence of breast cancer in women, it's a uh, it, it's I think it's not appreciated um, how big a source of uh, of illness and and mortality that is. Um, many people think of um, breast cancer or other cancers too as being primarily due to inherited genes, but most. Most breast cancer is not only due to inherited genes, but also to environmental factors and generally the interaction between environmental factors and inherited genes. So an outline of what I'm going to talk about, I'm going to give a few key examples of what we know now about environmental chemicals in breast cancer. I'm going to highlight a couple of findings from the newer paper where we used 
key characteristics of breast carcinogens, like what do they do as a way to identify new chemicals that we could consider potentially breast carcinogens, and uh, resources for reducing harmful exposures. So there are uh, multiple pathways, biological pathways that are well, well known, well accepted, uh, well documented of how breast cancer is caused. So um, chemicals can alter breast development, which leaves the breast vulnerable to carcinogens. A, a good example of this is the uh, synthetic hormone pharmaceutical diethyl sylvestrol, or DEF. <clears throat> it was prescribed in the US uh, in the 50s and 60s um, and found a cause in the, uh, in the children. Uh, it, was, it was prescribed during pregnancy and during the, ch the children of the women who took it during pregnancy have increased in a variety of, of uh, outcomes, including uh, breast cancer. Actually, breast cancer has increased in both the mothers and the daughters. Um, uh, chemicals later in life um, can mimic can mimic hormones um, and and cause growth of estrogen sensitive cells, um, or, or not just mimic hormones, but also increase the amount of hormones. And um, the good example for this that's well accepted is a hormone replacement therapy in postmenopausal women does increase breast cancer risk. There's not any question or argument about that. It's, it's um, any discussions about postmenopausal hormones is usually about the trade-offs between risks and benefits, and, um, but, but the uh, fact that it, uh, estrogen plus progesterone causes breast cancer is uh, not contested. Um, and then ionizing radiation uh, damages DNA <clears throat> and um, is uh, kind of a third important pathway. This is overly simplistic, but these are sort of three, shows the different kinds of ways that chemicals can uh, affect breast cancer. And in, in the US and many other parts of the world, chemicals don't have to be tested before they're put into products. And so what we have is a situation where there are a lot of chemicals that have these kinds of effects. Um, and uh, and so we're concerned that those also those exposures will also increase breast cancer risk because they do similar things. Um, and this actually is it's not just about breast cancer, but in terms of lactation, uh, it's showing that um, these chemical exposures can also affect how the breast develops and impair impair lactation. This is an example of. BPS, which was a, a BPA substitute, uh, how it uh, impairs milk production in rodents. And there are studies in humans that also show um, that PFAS uh, uh, exposures affect uh, the ability to breastfeed. And so, yeah, it's not just about breast cancer, but early puberty and also uh, lactation affected by these same kinds of chemical exposures. So this is, um, I'm switching, uh, just uh, moving ahead to talking about this newer paper that we released in January, uh, where we identified 900 plus chemicals that have uh, biological evidence that suggests that they are similar to and could cause uh, in, or increase risk of breast cancer. And we use data from experimental animal studies, but also from cell-based test data. And uh, one of the points of this paper is to show how we could use cell-based test data in order to um, identify hazards, uh, potential breast carcinogens, um, without having to wait for, certainly not for human evidence, but even uh, for animal evidence. And so the, the idea of, how, of the, like the, the mental model for how we do this is we study first how does breast cancer develop. Um, so we think there's, there are molecular mechanisms like an enzyme that produces estradiol um, then in the body. And then there's biological pathways that I, sh I shared some of them with you, um, where if you have estrogen, it can cause cells to divide, cancer cells that have estrogen receptor to divide, and that can increase breast cancer. So we, we identify multiple pathways like this. And then um, there separately, chemicals are being tested 
um, in uh, cell-based assays and other kinds of um, assays to, uh, is a kind of new, a new part of toxicology is gathering more information from, from cell culture assays that's more mechanistic. And so we can say, oh, here's some chemical exposures of, the, you know, they tested 2,000 chemicals. Here's some chemicals that increase, they cause the cells to increase synthesis of estradiol. So if they increase synthesis, if the chemical increases synthesis of estradiol, that is going to uh, increase uh, uh, breast cancer risk. And so we can infer the link from chemical exposure to breast cancer by connecting these two bodies of information. And that's sort of the fundamental you know, like approach that we're taking to create these lists of, uh, of breast cancer hazards. Uh, I hope that's clear, and we can, you can ask me questions about it later. If not, um, this is sort of another way of just of, of showing what I talked about earlier. It's a cell. It can be a, a cell in the breast. It has some estrogen receptors in purple. It has some progesterone receptor there in green. Um, and so one way that, um, that when, when people started talking about endocrine disruptors in the 1990s, the first thing was about chemicals that mimic estrogen, bisphenol A, nylphenol. Um, they bind to the estrogen receptor and activate it, cause it to turn on the cell machinery and make cells divide and, and so on. Now, we published a paper a few years ago with a new mechanism where we found that actually there's a lot of cells, they don't mimic the estrogen, I mean, uh, chemicals, they don't mimic the estrogen uh, uh, molecule and activate the receptor. But what they do is they make the cells make more estradiol or make more progesterone. And so um, that's a group that we're super interested in uh, now and uh, are, are part of our, our list. So chemicals that can do either of these things, we have on our list of um, potential breast carcinogens. Um, so yeah, so how we made a list of uh, 900 plus. It includes chemicals that cause mammary gland tumors in uh, experimental animal studies. So that um, that's sort of just saying, okay, if it causes mammary tumors in animals, it probably causes breast cancer in humans. There might be some cases where it doesn't, but, but it's a very good predictor, most likely. <clears throat> then, as I mentioned, chemicals that increase estrogen or progesterone synthesis, we also uh, consider them to be potential breast carcinogens, and then chemicals that activate the estrogen receptor. <clears throat> Uh, and we, um, that's, so, that, so that's kind of how we made our list. Um, and then what we did is we said, well, let's test out, let's test out, do these, do chemicals that, um, that increase estradiol or progesterone or uh, both of them, are they more likely to cause mammary tumors in animals than chemicals, um, than, uh, basically are, are chemicals that cause mammary tumors in animals more likely to have these characteristics of increasing estradiol and progesterone versus chemicals that don't cause mammary tumors in animals. And so we made that comparison here. And um, so the percent of chemicals um, that increased est for estradiol increasing, um, <clears throat> over 30% of the mammary carcinogens, that's the animal carcinogens, um, over 30% of them increased estradiol, but only about 20% of the non-mammary carcinogens. The, um, <clears throat> they're still tested in a cancer test, and they didn't cause mammary tumors, and so they're less likely to increase estrogen. And we say the same thing for progesterone, and um, this is just showing the significance of the difference. The biggest difference is for chemicals that increase both estradiol and progesterone, a very significant um, difference where mammary carcinogens were much more likely to increase both of these hormones. Um, we went on, here's estrogen receptor activator, so also a very significant um, uh, enrichment of, of, of this, this activity, the, the ability to activate the estrogen receptor among chemicals that cause mammary tumors versus chemicals that don't cause mammary tumors. Uh, we looked at endocrine, any, any of these endocrine disrupting effects and uh, also genotoxicity. 
uh, as well. But um, the the most important point from this slide is just that um, based on the based on the, the enrichment of this kinds of activity among chemicals that cause mammary tumors in rats, we think that these are good ways to um, chemicals that have these activities in in cells of uh, increasing hormones that we're there likely to um, increase breast cancer risk and we maybe we don't even have to go to the animal study in order to make that determination. Um, and yeah, if they had both the endocrine disrupting effect and genotoxicity, it was also um, a very important combination for predicting chemicals that were mammary carcinogens. So conclusions just from this part of the work was that we identified you know, hundreds of chemicals that could increase breast cancer risk by combining traditional sort of animal experimental studies with mechanistic in cell-based data. Um, rodent uh, chemicals that cause mammary tumors in rodents, they're more likely to increase estrogen and progesterone synthesis, activate the estrogen receptor, and cause DNA damage compared to non-mammary carcinogens. And so this highlights how regulatory chemical assessments could be strengthened to better protect human health, which is that we can use the cell-based assays, test many chemicals, and then um, and then uh, try to keep them, uh, try to prevent exposure to those chemicals that activate these pathways. Uh, and now that we've done that, we are um, trying to, we're doing another paper that is going to highlight for these 900 chemicals, where do people get exposed to them? Where does the exposure come from? Um, uh, predicted levels of exposure and biomonitoring data, environmental releases, current regulations to help um, the important, it's important information to help advocates and, um, uh, and regulators identify where they can intervene in order to reduce exposure uh, to these chemicals. Uh, and now talking about reducing exposure, some I'm just going to uh, quickly talk about um, or share some uh, resources that we have about reducing, reducing exposures because so exposure to these you know, potential breast carcinogens come from, from gasoline, auto exhaust, air pollution, solvents and paint removers, flame retardants, pesticides, uh, water disinfection byproducts. All of these actually have chemicals that cause mammary gland tumors in animals. And then there's endocrine disruptors, which are in many things. Here's a few examples, includes cleaners and personal care products, chemical sunscreens and plastics, some fragrances. Um, here are some examples, bisphenol A, phthalates, uh, parabens, PFAS, chemicals. Uh, not everybody is exposed equally. You can see that um, in this case for parabens, uh, in the U.S., uh, non-Hispanic black uh, women have much uh, higher levels of paraben exposure compared to other uh, racial categories um, in the, by, the, by the Center for Disease Control categories. Um, and so we need to, you know, be conscious that uh, health disparities can be also related to exposure disparities. Um, thinking about cancer prevention and where, you know, it's important to take action based on what we know and not uh, require wait, you know, wait for proof and that there's things that can be done from, on the, from the from regulation and to working with retailers and manufacturers, um, to, to ask them to be more um, discerning about what they will make or sell. Um, institutions have buying, um, you know, they uh, can have policies for what they will and won't buy for their uh, uh, institutions and then reaching consumers uh, directly. So there are many levels where we can um, intervene. Oh, here, I didn't realize I had all of this on here, but um, there we go. Um, uh, so these are all, and these are all campaigns that are really underway now, changing standards, using class-based approaches and regulations. These are all fight, you know, things people are working really hard to make, uh, to make happen. Uh, phase out, um, uh, making a marketing advantage by raising consumer awareness uh, and purchasing specifications from institutions. 
Silent Spring has um, tried to put the information that we have about exposure, about chemicals and exposures into a smartphone app, which is free and available in English and Spanish. Um, it's called Detox Me, and it, uh, and it has um, a variety of tips for home and cleaning and personal care. This part that I, my favorite part of it is these top 10 tips because I can't deal, I don't like to be on the phone for too long looking at endless tips. And so you can, there's a, there's a page where it just has the top 10. I, I appreciate that part. Um, and it gives suggestions. Uh, and it's really important, not just for the individuals to take action, trying to protect themselves, and uh, but, but the systems level change is what we're uh, really going for. So we're really advocating for people to vote and, um, and make uh, their make sure their elected officials know how they feel about this issue. Telling friends, family, coworkers, and neighbors about this. Um, get on our mailing list. Check our social media. So that's all. Um, and I um, again, I'm so happy to have been invited. Thank you so much. So, my name is Jasmine Jimwalk. I am the Water Quality and Community Health Protection Coordinator for the Alaska Community Action on Toxics. I am Anupiak and Cherokee from the village of Elam, Alaska, which is located in the Arctic. And we created an environmental health toolkit for breast cancer prevention and protecting the health of people living with breast cancer. Here at ACAT, we believe everyone has the right to clean air, clean water, and toxic-free food. And I want to take a second to acknowledge that our offices are located on the lands of the Denina peoples. So protecting our mamaks means to protect our breast in St. Lawrence Island dialect. In Alaska, female breast cancer is the most common cancer diagnosed among Alaska Native women. Alaskan Native women are more likely to be diagnosed with breast cancer at a younger age and at later stages than non-Native women in Alaska. And breast cancer in women under 40 years old is 58% higher in Alaska Native women compared to non-Native women in the same region. So it was very important to us to create this toolkit. The Alaska Community Action on Toxics teamed up with the Alaska Community Health Aid Program to make this toolkit for health aides in rural Alaska to use since they are our medical providers, they are our first responders. There's 550 community health aides in over 170 rural Alaska villages. Um, Alaska is a very large state and a lot of the communities are very small and spread apart. So um, getting health care in Alaska is very difficult. And um, so we created this toolkit to help Alaska Native women reduce risk of breast cancer. And since health aides are the first people to see these symptoms of breast cancer, we wanted to make this as a tool for them to use. So the toolkit identifies chemicals found in the Arctic linked to breast cancer, and it helps to determine if a patient may have had an environmental exposure and provides information about how to reduce exposure. And in everything we do at ACAT, we honor Annie Aloha. She was a community health aide that brought attention to health problems that she noticed in her community after the U.S. Air Force established a base on their traditional lands. She knew that the hazardous materials left behind were the cause of sudden high rates of cancer, low birth weight in babies and miscarriages. The land and wildlife that they depended on was contaminated with asbestos, PCBs, pesticides, solvents, lead-based paint, fuel tanks, and barrels full of lubricants and fuel. And because of her advocacy for health and justice, 
ACAT was created and they worked to they worked relentlessly to get the military to prioritize cleaning up their mess. So we really make sure to honor Annie Aloha and everything we do because she was a community health aide that was advocating for their health. So our breast cancer prevention toolkit allows people to make informed decisions because in the Arctic, we are exposed to so many chemicals bearing burdens that we did not create. This toolkit includes an environmental health assessment to help CHAPS identify patients' exposures And in Alaska, in the Arctic, pollutants from all over the world are carried by wind and ocean currents contributing to contamination of our lands and waters, our fish and wildlife. There are hundreds of military sites across Alaska that hold toxic waste. And the Arctic indigenous peoples are one of the most highly contaminated populations on the planet due to our reliance on subsistence foods. At ACAT, we prevent, we work to prevent harm and eliminate unnecessary exposure by raising awareness and helping people to reduce and prevent exposure. The toolkit informs about chemicals that cause cancer and hormone disruption and helps people to develop a plan to reduce their exposure and encourage their friends and family to do the same thing. And I want to acknowledge that people of different gender identities can be at risk of breast cancer. Furthermore, transgender, queer, non-binary, and two-spirit people may face discrimination and lack of access to gender-affirming breast cancer information, screening, and care. ACAT advocates for an approach to breast cancer research awareness and resource access that is gender inclusive. Breast cancer research is needed that includes the experiences and investigates risk factors of people of diverse gender identities and for those who may or may not have undergone gender affirming care, making breast cancer health care inclusive of and accessible to people of marginalized gender identities is incredibly important. Throughout this toolkit, we have attempted to be mindful of our gendered language. In this toolkit, we use the term peoples when addressing broad statements about breast cancer, and we use the gender term woman in statements based on information gathered from studies performed with women participants, and most do not specify other gender identities. Gender inclusivity in ACAT's breast cancer prevention work is an ongoing goal of the organization and we welcome suggestions as to how we might improve. And now we will have Selma talk about our toolkit. Thank you, Jasmine. Thank you. Good morning, yeah, everybody. Okay. Yes, go ahead, Olga. No, 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 I, I just wanted to say uh, thank you to Jasmine. Thank you very much because what you presented is so inspiring. Uh, that we know about uh, what ACAD is doing. And this is really amazing, like working with affected communities. Um, and I'm, I'm pretty sure that the token that you produce um, and that um, uh, uh, Sama will present now will be good to translate. Yes, it is for, uh, for the Arctic, but I'm pretty sure that the tips that are included, uh, are like they are important, like much beyond uh, uh, this area yeah uh okay thank you so much and Samba, please mm, just wanted to reflect because i like this presentation from jasmine so much thank you thank you so much jasmine and olga um good morning buenos dias good morning from alaska um I like Jasmine explained, this is such an important prevention tool that we have and that we want to share. And like Olga said, not only with Alaskans, but other people in the lower 48 and other parts of the world. Um, so Jasmine presented kind of the overview of the toolkit. We're looking at the table of contents. 
of, of this uh, prevention toolkit. Um, the first part is just an overview explaining the partnerships and the collaboration. I want to acknowledge um, the art for the cover was made by a summer intern, Kelly Dunn, with beautiful artwork. And we have many interns that throughout a couple of summers uh, helped develop this toolkit. We also had community health aides that reviewed the toolkit. And also our friend and colleague, uh, Dr. Ted Chetler, also reviewed the toolkit. Um, so we wanted to make the toolkit um, interesting and fun. And we try to digest the most important information in terms of environmental contaminants linked to breast cancer in Alaska, but also prepare the information in fact sheets, which makes it more um, easier to look at and read and understand. Um, the first part of the module, the first module for the toolkit talks about breast cancer, environmental chemicals. What is breast cancer? And I think our colleague and friend, Rudam Rodel uh, explained that in her presentation very well. Um, breast cancer in Alaska, Jasmine shares some of uh, very important facts about Alaska. Uh, one of the main concerns that we seen and heard from many women in um, many villages, remote communities in Alaska, is that they're seeing breast cancer at a younger age, which is a very um, high concern. Um, we also share in this first module um, how breast cancer and environmental justice relates to each other. We know that um, it's a higher body burden for women of color and um, women of the global majority uh, here in the US. Um, so it's an important thing to, to remind people that it's an environmental justice issue um, affecting women of color uh, of all over the world in a higher um, uh, way, uh, more severe way. Prevention starts with education. That's why we did this toolkit because we believe in, in education and prevention and because knowledge is power. And, um, and then I wanna and go I ahead wanna, before we move to the next slide. Uh, we're gonna um, um, check the model two um, and it's all the fact sheets that we created on the different chemicals and exposures that we see that are more relevant here in Alaska. Um, we have uh, fact sheets on air pollution, flame retardants, food packaging, and a lot of the food packaging issues is connected also to PFAS, contaminants, occupational exposure. We have a specific fact sheet about PFAS in household consumer products. We have a fact sheet about POPs, persistent organic pollutants, which we know is a one of the issues that we face here in Alaska because of global transport of contaminants um, and also military pollution and legacy pollution. We have a fact sheet about personal care products and cosmetics because we know that many of the personal care products that uh, are advertised for women of color and Latinas and Blacks and other minorities are marketed toward us because right, we need a lot of these chemicals to look beautiful and pretty, supposedly. Um, so we wanted to bring a, that personal care products and cosmetics fact sheet to um, talk about some of the myths and talk about the reality of chemicals affecting women of color. We have a fact sheet about pesticides, which is a big issue, like we've been talking about in this um, presentation. And then we have a fact sheet about traditional foods, diet, and nutrition. And this is important in Alaska, very, very important because um, Alaska Native cultures and communities here um, rely on traditional foods um, for millennia, and they still do the traditional gatherings and, and hunting. Um, so that's why we created one. Then at the end of the toolkit, we have an environmental health history and assessment form for um, community health aides to use as a tool um, to collect information. And then at the end, we had a great um, additional resources for breast cancer environmental health and references that we want to share. Next slide. So I mentioned the breast cancer in Alaska. We know that in women under the age of 40 is 58% higher in Alaska Native women compared to non-Hispanic white women in the same region. Um, like we mentioned, um, the laws, the federal laws here in the US were outdated for a long time, still need some update. 
Um, we have the Toxic Substance Control Act that was um, established in 1976, and that was updated in 2016. Um, that law grandfathered many thousands of chemicals back in the 70s, and there's like um, Rudan Rodell explained many of these chemicals are not tested for safety before they put in a in a product or a consumer product or a personal care product. So it's a huge, huge issue. Um, next slide. Environmental justice, more than 350,000 chemicals worldwide are currently registered for production and use. Um, and that's why prevention starts with education and, and knowledge about this. Not only we do education, we do advocacy work and policy, um, health, uh, policy and, and health um, regulations are very important and are definitely part of the prevention work of knowing the chemicals and now how they affect our health. Um, we have beautiful images showing um, friends and colleagues um, from different Alaska Native villages. Here's a, a beautiful picture from Tiffany Imingen, an elder from the north. Tiffany's from Sivuca, St. Lawrence Island in the Bering Sea. And we do not only uh, breast cancer prevention, we do also other educational work to provide the knowledge that women need to make informed decisions, prime informed consent. So we always support that. Next slide. Pink washing, something very important that we emphasize in the beginning of the modules, uh, the first module. Um, pink washer, and I give this definition, a company organization that claims to care about breast cancer by promoting a pink ribbon product, but at the same time produces, manufactures, or sells products that are linked to the disease, to breast cancer. And you're gonna see everything with a pink ribbon in it, and that's just marketing, as we know. Um, and hypocrisy, in my opinion, um, because many of these companies are some of the producers of many of the chemicals that are linked and associated to breast cancer. Um, I, I saw that Pam shared a link to the um, toolkit. Uh, it's um, posted in our website, so you can also kind of uh, check it out while I, I uh, share the information. Um, and we always provide in these fact sheets way to get more information in how other organizations and groups are um, fighting pink washing. And we partner with many organizations in terms of education and prevention. Uh, Think Before You Pink is a campaign from our uh, friends, Breast Cancer Action. Um, and, and we try to come together with the other organizations that are doing the work so because we're together, we're stronger. So um, next slide. So these are, uh, we're gonna go now to the module two. And these are just examples of a few fact sheets. Um, just so you know how they are organized, how the information is organized and, um, and what, what kind of information you can, you have and you can use. Um, the first part is, uh, contains fact sheets that cover most significant Sources, like I mentioned, of environmental chemical exposures linked to breast cancer um, here in Alaska. The first one is air pollution. Air pollution is a very important source of exposure in many Alaska Native communities. Um, communities that sometimes don't have roads or paved roads. So a lot of particulate matter um, around these communities, mostly in the summertime um, where there's no snow. Um, so. We try to explain the issue. What is air pollution in this case? Then we explain the next section in the fact sheet talks about what is a concern? What is a chemical of concern? Then we explain how we are exposed to it. Next slide. And then after explaining the how we are exposed, we share body of evidence um, on breast cancer risk for these different chemicals that are considered air pollutants, like particulate matter, PAHs, benzene, and, and other. And then at the end of the fact sheet, we have, what can you do? How can you make your, in this case, your indoor safer for um, toxic chemicals that are leached out from any personal care products or brought from the outdoors? But also how can you protect your health and the health of your family? Um, next slide. 
We have one, for example, on flame retardants. Now we know that flame retardants are linked to uh, uh, have many endocrine disruptor chemicals, and there's uh, overwhelming evidence uh, now coming out every day still on the links of flame retardants and chemicals in breast cancer. Again, we have an explanation of what is a flame retardant, what kind of chemical class of chemicals, uh, why is a concern, how are we exposed. In the case of, of flame retardants, we know that um, carpets, electronics, many children's toys and children's products have flame retardants in them. Couches, upholstery from sofas, uh, many uh, products that everybody uses um, every day. Then we explain facts on how also it affects um, the environment in the um, ecosystem and the animals in the ecosystem is so important here in Alaska and everywhere in the world, right? Because of food security and all the uh, challenges that we're facing um, with climate change also. So, um, and then next slide, we share, um, like I said, at the end of the fact sheet, we have how can we protect ourselves? Then we have the assessing environmental exposure, the assessment form that I mentioned in the beginning. Um, and, and I'm not gonna go into detail. I just wanted to share it with you, it's in the toolkit. And you should please review it. If you have any suggestions on how we can better it, um, I invite you to use it in your communities. It's an excellent tool. Um, right now, we were able to um, train community health aides at their annual conference here in Anchorage and they uh, received the toolkit uh, very happily and, and grateful because there's no other um, toolkit like this. There's no other uh, document like this that links and shares information about environmental chemicals, exposures, and environmental justice. Next slide. Additional resources, there's many pages of um, um, acknowledging the work of other organizations in the US and the world. Um, educating about breast cancer and prevention on breast cancer. So that's the last part of the toolkit before the references. Next slide. We created a poster, a poster that we are giving to clinics to put up, schools, uh, city buildings, offices, anybody that wants to. There's a QR code that people can scan with their phones and go directly to the toolkit in our website. So. That's also available available in our website. You can print it and use it for, for your offices or clinics. Next slide. And then we created also fact cards. We took the fact sheets and we created a summary of it. And these fact cards, we leave at tables. We When we do tabling events, we just give them out for people to have a quick reference and to look at um, uh, a summary of those fact sheets. Next slide. Very exciting about this part of the toolkit. We also collaborate with other organizations to make our work reach out more people. And also we believe in um, language restoration, um, language re revitalization. So we are partnering with a nonprofit here in Anchorage called um, Alaska Public Interest Research Group at PIRC. And we are working with their translation um, teams and we are translating these fact cards into Yungtung, Yupik. Yupik because it's the most uh, Alaska native spoken language right now in Alaska. And we are in a collaboration with them translating all these fact cards into Yungtung, Yupik. So we are very proud of this collaboration and having this information translated into um, languages uh, to access and reach out to more people. Um, next slide, I think this is might be the last one. We have the Indigenous Women Network, a Facebook group that we created as part of the Indigenous Working uh, in Women's Girls and, and, and Women's Gathering, Girls and Gatherings that we've done. So this is a place that you can go and, and go and check our work in social media. Next slide. And of course we wanna, uh, uh, are so grateful and give thank you to um, the foundations that give support to ACAT encourage this work. Um, the toolkit was created uh, through a grant uh, provided by the Alaska Run for Women here in Alaska, the Cedar Tree Foundation, Groundswell Fund as well, and individual donors. And I think that's the last one.
Thank you so much.